Hey folks, welcome to The Sacred Speaks. My name is John Price and I'm your host. Today I am eager to introduce Mark Airy and we'll certainly get to him, but first I've got a little housekeeping to tend to. If you're listening to this on audio, check it out on YouTube. Sacred Speaks is now on YouTube. And if you will like and subscribe to the page, it helps as it grows. Thank you. The community is growing and building and in two months now, I think we're going to start with the series. I don't quite know what to call it yet, but uh, we're doing something cool in about that time. Today's conversation is about the book of Revelation, and we also use the book of Job. And again, I'll introduce today's participant, but let me just say, it's very easy to love him. <laughs> so uh, he's an interesting fella who has a an incredible take on religion in general, Christianity in particular. He's been a priest was an ordained Greek Orthodox priest for 34 years and, uh, and has a lot to say about theology, about psychology, religion, and, uh, and spirituality. We talk about the book of Revelation, and I'll let him do the explaining because he's in fact translated the original Greek into English. But for now, I want to read a piece by Ed Edinger in The Archetype of the Apocalypse, And I think this is so important from kind of a traditional Jungian lens. Considering an individual's experience of the archetype, the apocalypse bodes catastrophe only for the stubbornly rationalistic secular ego that refuses to grant the existence of a greater psychic authority than itself. Since it cannot bend, it has to break. Thus, end of the world dreams, invasion from outer space, nuclear bombs, etc., do not necessarily presage psychic catastrophe for the dreamer, but may, if properly understood, refer to the coming into visibility of manifestations of the self, the nucleus of the psyche, and present the opportunity for enlargement of the personality. So this is on a a, a psychological level that uh, Edinger's, speaking of certainly Jung was as well, and uh, Mark read a great deal, if not all of the collected works, years ago, and the book of Job has been a close companion to him. And I had this great collision between the book of Job and the, uh, the, the uh, book of Revelation. So thank you, Mark, so much for your time and your developing friendship. I'm, I'm, I'm really eager and excited to mine this territory and continue to uh, be a, a fellow wanderer with you. This project, if you're new to it, The Sacred Speaks, you can check it out at thesacredspeaks.com. Also, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can listen to it on audio. Check out all the podcast affiliates, SoundCloud, Spotify, Google Google Play, iTunes. Uh, Or you can watch it on YouTube if you're listening to it on one of those affiliates. Um, Any liking or subscribing greatly helps as far as findability is concerned. Um, And also just as far as community is concerned, which is something that I'm working on. Thank you. Um, the uh, podcast is sponsored by the Center for the Healing Arts and Sciences. Check us out at the center for hascom It's a boutique integrative wellness center that my wife, Lila Scott Price, and I started some time ago. And we are having a lot of fun expanding and growing. Um, so you can check that out. Also, we have a YouTube panel discussion that all the clinicians of the center uh, participate in. We come together and talk about um, interesting and sometimes difficult to explore complex subjects. We just had a panel discussion on, um, on hate and uh, the, the, the hatred that is being enacted on the community of um, Asian Americans, Asians, and Pacific Islanders. And it was a, uh, an interesting and, and an important discussion. So you can check that on YouTube. Just go search the Center for the Healing Arts and Sciences. Thanks for that. The theme music for The Sacred Speaks is brought to you by Modern Nations. Check them out at modernnationsmusic.com. And I find their music to be pretty amazing. They're friends of mine that I happily support. So check them out. Listen to the song. If you hang out to the end of the episode, you will hear the full song of Clouds is the, uh, is the theme music. Thanks, guys. For the past three weeks... I have been teaching a class at the Young Center at younghouston.org, and just this last class, Brian Marescu came along for the ride, and we engaged in an amazing discussion with some people that uh, I'm, pr- I'm pretty honored to sit in a class with a lot of the people that participated. So for those of you who are participating in the class, 
Wow, what a what a cool crew, and uh, it just is it bodes well for any future classes. Brian, thanks for being there to discuss your book, The Immortality Key. I will continue uh, championing and trumpeting that incredible work. Uh, and really, this uh, this conversation with Mark is one of the threads that that Brian brought into my life. Really, uh, Mark and Brian have worked really closely on the Immortality Key, so you'll hear Mark talk about that. And the class will conclude this week, so there's still one more class if you really want to uh, come and join. But for now, uh, the class will finish this week, and I'll probably start teaching another one in the next three months. Uh, So thanks again for those of you who are participating. Thanks, Brian, for this wonderful work. Last week, a dear friend and mentor, Nanine Ewing, died, and it was uh, heartbreaking, and her, her... presence is and will continue to be and has been uplifting and supportive to so many folks. And we in the Houston community will certainly miss her. I I mention her today because she's been one of the longest and most supportive voices of the podcast. And as this was growing and developing this project, she was always there to um, provide guidance and insight and, uh, and helpful support. So the other day, it was Thursday of last week, I wasn't able to work anymore, and I just needed to, to rest. So I, I canceled my day, I went outside and set up a hammock, and I listened to the interview that I did with Nanin. I direct you to episode 17 with Dr. Nanin Ewing, and we discuss death, and the body, and the unconscious, and one of the most incredible scenarios happened. I was sitting listening to her speak, and I just took a nap to her voice. And I woke up to my voice saying, I'm so glad that I asked you about death. And then I rewound the podcast and listened to the 20-minute dive that Nanin took into um, her understanding of death, and I found great comfort in my own grief for losing a friend. So uh, as we talk about the apocalypse and the end of the world, I think it's appropriate to talk about um, the, the end of this life for Nanine Ewing. Um, and uh, now she is wherever she may be. Uh, and Nanine, uh, so much love. And uh, I always appreciated you and your support. Thank you. So uh, I urge anybody to go listen to episode 17. It, it, was a, a helpful, it was a helpful episode, of course, to hear from a friend, and I'll continue to listen to that whenever I need to connect with Nanine. But it's also a really deep dive into the fundamental aspects and forces of, uh, of life and uh, it, the eternal aspects that we are all subjected to. And you'll hear Mark and I talk a little bit about this today. So for now... Thank you for being here. And Mark, thank you for participating in this. Again, I'm eager to, to, to grow those threads and to dive deeper. Mark Airy, welcome. I have I was beaming when you uh, when you dialed in because I've been so excited to chat. And before we start, I want to read through your bio, and if you will sit there patiently and listen to me talk about you, and then we'll uh, we'll get going. So for those listening or watching, Mark Airy was born in Richmond, Virginia, and raised outside of Washington D.C. Ari converted to Orthodox Christianity from the Episcopal Church when he was 22 years old. He graduated in 1975 from the University of Maryland, cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa, and a BA in Latin Language and Literature. In 1976, he matriculated at the Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Brooklyn, Massachusetts. He graduated in 1979, receiving an MDiv with distinction, and was subsequently ordained both deacon and presbyter in October 1979. In the intervening 34 years, Airy served six parishes, last interim dean of the Archdiocesan Cathedral in New York City, 
as well as parishes in Baltimore, New Haven, and Nashville twice. Frederick, uh, where was that? Frederick what? Maryland. Maryland, thank you. And New York City. In 2006, he was awarded the rank of Economos. Did I say that right? Economos. Economos. And in 2007, that of Proto Presbyter. Did I say that right? Oh. Uh, uh, how, how elevating. <laughs> In 2013, he asked to return to the ranks of the laity in order to marry, and did so, marrying Lynn Cameron Hayes on December 9th, 2013. Ari has one grown daughter, Zoe, who lives in New York City, and her three daughters, Lillian, Beatrice, and Evelyn. That is, oh, Ari was invited to be executive director of the Hellenic Initiative, and we will post the HellenicInitiative.org, a global venture of philanthropy that does economic development in Greece. In 2019, Ari took six months sabbatical to travel on pilgrimage to India, after which he began working as a private consultant in both the fields of venture philanthropy and communications. Wow, man, that's uh, that's an impressive uh, bio there. Well, it sounds more impressive than it ever felt, I can assure you of that. <laughs> I, uh, I, yeah, you have many leather bound books and very exciting discoveries to report about. So we've been a good life. I'm a very, I'm a, I live every day a very grateful human being. I can tell you that much. Well, amen. And that's something to aspire to. Here it is. Here's one of yes. your books The Apocalypse. Yes. Show the other one. I don't have the other one on, uh, you just oh, had it. That one. This is the graphic novel version. Yes. I got the PDF of that. Which yeah, it's I out of love. print, unfortunately. And even, it? yeah, it's out of print. We're trying to get it back into print. It's it's pretty spectacular. I have. It's to a, I agree. I agree. So my story is that on Sunday, it was Easter Sunday. Hmm. I was sitting in my office, and it was beautiful. It was my home office, and I opened the windows, and I was reading your book of Revelation next to the book of Revelation from my. Uh, new Oxford Standard uh, with a with Apocrypha. Yes, I have my Greek text right here. I'm jealous of that. I'm working on that. Duolingo is hooking me up with my Greek right there now. There you go. <laughs> uh, and the coolest thing happened. I was I was reading the Book of Revelation and kind of like having a pretty profound experience. Uh, I had been through the Book of Revelation before, but not really sat with it in the way that I did. Of course, motivated by. Uh, this conversation today. Mm -hmm. And here it was an Easter Sunday, and when the wind would blow in the right direction, I would hear hymns mm -hmm. from up the street. I, somebody must have been having like some kind of a yard church, sure. and it was awesome. The other beautiful thing about our conversation today is you, uh, you suggested that we also anchor our conversation in one of my favorite books, which is Answer to Job. One of Jung. mine as well. Yes. Uh, and, and despite the fact that I got a PhD in Jungian psychology, I can safely say you've read this book more than I. So, uh, so I, I'm, I was, I, all day I've been excited to jump into this conversation. So I'll shut up now and say it's really nice to meet you, and I'm excited to chat. I'm delighted, John. It's a, it's a great privilege and a, pr and a pleasure to be here today. And anytime I get a chance to talk about the Apocalypse, Ioannu, the uh, revelation of John, or the unlayering of John, or the Apocalypse of John, it's, a, it's because it's such a unique book, right, in yeah. the New Testament canon, uh, it's, a, it's a great book. Well, so you were saying earlier, you've, you're no... Uh speaking on these subjects is of course not new as a priest you've you've done this quite a bit um and the 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 uh, let's let's kind of figure out where we want to go but i certainly want to jump into revelation uh i want to talk about interpretation as mm -hmm. both a problem and a solution mm -hmm. and and then i'd like to then move into the book of job if you're cool with that structure they will all of course intertwine but if that works for you, we can very much so. Very much. course. So the the first question that I um, I guess before we start that, would you just tee us up in an overview of why you were so captivated with the Book of Revelation, and then we'll get into the nuances of the translation. 
Sure. I mean, here's my uh, short story. My avocation is a translator. I've been translating from Latin and Greek since I was 13 years old. I love translation because translation to me is a metaphor for life, how to convey one reality and make it appreciable and intelligible to others and connect to them. It's like building a bridge. Every time you translate anything, you're building a bridge to meet someone else. And with a very dear friend of mine who unfortunately passed away in 2004, we had this big vision to translate the entirety of the New Testament in a new way. Because translation is always never finished, right? It's never finished. <laughs> you just put a period on it for that day and you look at your watch and you say, okay, we'll come back later and improve it somehow if we can. And so we wanted to do the entirety of the New Testament. And what we did was we just started at the back. <laughs> we went to Revelation first because we thought it would be fun. Um, it is fun. As a matter of fact, you held up a copy of the book earlier. And just for your audience, for anyone who's watching it, that's a, a facsimile of the oldest version of the book of Revelation in existence in that's the right. world. That's the Codex Sinaiticus. Uh, hmm. And the actual first words that you see at the top left are Apocalypse Jesu Christu, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's, it's fascinating to me that we could somehow infuse a, a new translation with deeper meanings, deeper context for people, so that it doesn't become a scare tactic for people. I mean, the book of Revelation is about hope. It's not about death and destruction and all the stuff that contemporary Christianity or a lot of contemporary Christianity, I think, uses scripture in general and particularly Revelation to control people. You know, I used to say as a priest years ago, you know, religion only serves two purposes. It only serves two purposes. It either controls or it transforms. Mm. And most of religion tries to control. It should be 99% transformation, 1% control, right? I mean, if you have to wake up in the morning and you need someone to tell you, it's not a good, uh, good idea today to go out and rampage and pillage and kill and slaughter. You know, you're a sociopath. You, know, right. you, you need, we need to transform. And Revelation is a transformational text. I mean, it's it's psychedelic. I don't care what it's anybody. It's totally says. psychedelic. Holy That's why I agreed to do a graphic novel. I didn't do the graphic novel version. It was had a different artist, a different producer, but it was my translation, and I was thrilled. I'm so thrilled. I've, hopefully, we'll get it back in print one day because I think it's astonishing. Actually, it's beautiful. It really. It, um, the I've got a couple of really cool graphic novels by Alan Moore, and mm -hmm. um, there's one of them called uh, Promethea. And the the it's so beautiful. And when I opened up your your link, I thought this is the same kind of material. This is it's evocative. It's interesting. It has an edge. I I hope it's back in print. But selfishly, I got it, so I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, you have the PDF. That's, That's a, right. Almost as good. Almost. I do want the pages though to to, yeah, yeah. to rifle through. Uh, so so tr trans. I love this sentence you said. The translation is always never finished. And and there's a there's a certain what I get from people who really study this material, you, you start to hear about the living nature or the living document or this is a living text. Mm -hmm. And and part of what I think happens so often with a more literal translation is the text becomes static and 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 stuck. And and then of course we've got all kinds of problems like the one you're talking about, that people are um unconsciously rebelling against a sense of control rather than allowing themselves to be transported into a different sense of reality. So uh, you, you started at the back, which I think was may have been uh, coincidental but incredibly intuitive. What happened through the process? Uh, my friend died um, oh. in 2004. He was, when I say I'm the principal translator of everything, but he was like kind of my muse in a way. We were both mm -hmm. clergymen. Uh, we were very close friends. Uh, Philemon Sevastiades was his name. One of the smartest, the smartest priests I've ever met. I mean, smarter than any other priest I ever met and smarter than most people I've ever met. And we had a lot of fun doing this together. Our, our next project was the Gospel of John because we wanted to do all the Johannine material. 
uh, it died uh, with him. Uh, it was a sad time for me and obviously for his wife and children with whom I'm still close today. What a loss. Uh, but interestingly enough, in 2015, I had a, a weird dream and I, you know, there's dreams and then there's what you would refer to as encounters, right? Mm. This was an encounter with him, not a dream of him. And um, I can't remember everything from it, but I remember waking up and thinking, I need to publish the translation of John, but it has to be a meta translation, not a translation, which is, of course, a, it's very redundant in Greek, because in Greek, the word for translation is meta phrasis. So it's a meta, meta, meta translation. Anyway, and I did. I, I, I translate. I published it as the gospel of love. Um, in 2017, where I really went a little off. Well, I colored outside the lines, let's put it that way, with the translation, but I'm very happy with it. And I was very happy to finally put into print uh, the work that we had done together, because that was the last translation that we did together. I've actually translated the entirety of the New Testament. I just haven't published it. What an endeavor. Yeah, it's, you know, but I love translating. I can spend an inordinate amount of time translating a single line because it, 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 it translation transports me let's put it that way mm -hmm. I, I just love doing it uh, not a professional i don't even have a degree in ancient greek my degree is in latin I but that. i always tell people if you want to really learn greek ancient greek learn latin first the discipline of latin will carry you into the florid nature of greek because greek can be a little wild sometimes you know Greek yeah, is very Greek is closer to Sanskrit than Latin will ever be. So that's what's when I was initially talking to Brian Marescu, uh, his knowledge of Latin, Sanskrit, and Greek is is extremely helpful. But but then of course I'm a total outsider, and so I'm trying to play catch up by you know my however many minutes a day I can get into my little app and learn how to say the rice is pink, but. I, <laughs> But I, but I'm trucking away. You know, I'm yeah. I'm I'm convinced I'm gonna I'm gonna get there. But what happens though is for most people who may know a second language, mm. that's that that's that's a positive, right? I can speak some Spanish. I can get around. Yeah. But we're talking about something utterly different, you know, because we're we're dealing with an ancient, a somewhat ancient perspective. And there's a lot you need to know that's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. It's not word Correct. for word. So Nothing is a one-to-one -one correspondence. And anyone who tells you that it is, is doesn't know anything about language. Um, nothing is a one-to-one -one correspondence. You have to... That's why I say that translation is like creating a palimpsest. You know, you erase one series of words to put another series of words over it. That's what a palimpsest is, right? You erase... And then you write over it because, you know, vellum was very precious in the ancient world. But over time, the original bleeds through. So that concept of a palimpsest is what makes a good translation a, a good translation, that you feel some of the emergent original language. And that's why I translated the book of Revelation the way that I did, because just to give you one quick example, if I may. Go to the King James, the Revised Standard, the New American Standard. I don't care what version you use. And I, I was raised as an Anglican, so I'm a great lover of the King James. It's the only one I read in English. However, when it says that they opened the seals, right? There are seven seals that had to be opened yep. in the book of Revelation. And they opened the first seal, and then this catastrophe happened. They opened the second seal, this catastrophe happened. But what does it mean to open an ancient seal? You actually, you open an ancient seal. You don't unscrew it. You don't turn it, you break it. That's how ancient seals are opened. Hmm. So in my translation, I use the word crack, break, you know, other uh, synonyms, so to speak, so that you get a sense of the dynamism of the language, not necessarily the dynamism of the particular word, but translation is all about context. It's not just about, you know, this word has one analog in the other language. That's absurd. I mean, even in English, we know that there's more than one analog. Absolutely. So it's fun that way. That's what makes translation fun. Choosing those analogs so that they 
marry, if you will, or they incorporate or baptize the words around them. I really like your example and feel at liberty as you are inspired to provide as many examples as you like, because it's very, you know, the, the problem that I see, and this is just my own issue, I guess, or maybe other people feel this way, is that I, getting into these texts is laborious. Can be. And, and I think that we, what, what'll happen is that people that matriculate, to use your word earlier, through a, a or they're initiated into various traditions, they forget where they started. And so here I am, a novice or a, you know somebody who's just excited, I'm enthusiastic, I'm an amateur, and I'm talking to folks who have an expertise way far down the line. And so we've got a, I think of myself as like a reminder of, hey, but come back here where you were when you started, and let's try to talk about what stirred the pot there, because... Most people think like, oh, I read the King James. Great, that's the Bible. Not that there are all kinds of interpretations. And so why, why the King James? Let's stay there for a second. Why the King James and not another? Simple emotional connectivity. You know, it's what my mother, I still have the copy my mother gave me over 60 years ago. I mean, I, I, I it's just emotional. Plus, I mean, there are some expressions in the King James I don't care who you are translating for. You can't beat them. Huh. I even throw out a bone to the King James. Uh, and it's from Job with yeah. kings and counselors of the earth. Uh, mm -hmm. I use that expression in the book of Revelation. Uh, I've, I've been known to steal a little bit from the bard from time to time. In, ah. Uh, oh, yeah. My son's doing a project right on him. Yeah, he's great. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've done that for the Gospel of John. I think I took... Two expressions, one from Hamlet and one from somebody else. I can't remember it off the top of my head, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, to help translate it because you get the cadence, you know, you get that rhythm of the language, which sometimes mirrors the rhythm of the original. Um, well, and, and how much attention do you pay when you translate something? How much, and this is for you, I know because there's a lot of different translations, a lot of different people. How much do you attend to what? I guess this is letter of the law, spirit of the law, or kind of modern day, because there's something said, but then you have to actually think through through how we would say that colloquially or with uh, the modern day expressions. How much do you try to marry those two things between what may have been intended and how we can try to make it make sense to people from our perspective today? Well, some of it is just trying to get underneath to the meaning of the original. I'll give you my famous example from St. Paul. I think it's fair to say that St. Paul was a highly intelligent man, right? He knew Hebrew. His Greek is impeccable. As a matter of fact, um, bad company, the quote, bad company corrupts good morals, is from the Greek poet Menander. And the only place that that verse exists is in St. Paul. Huh. So, I mean, so he's a pretty intelligent guy. Nevertheless... People sometimes feel that St. Paul's unintelligible. So my first question is, well, if he was so intelligent and he's writing these letters to particular groups of people, the Christians in Corinth, Rome, Ephesus, Philippi, wherever, why would he make himself unintelligible to the very people he's trying to pastor and assist? And my most favorite, uh, favorite example of scripture is the so-called baptism for the dead in Corinthians, you know? You know, if the dead not rise, why then do they baptize for the dead? And this, of course, in the uh, Church of Latter-day Saints, becomes an actual ritual, as you probably are aware. Mm -hmm. But what people forget is that in the original texts of the New Testament, there's no punctuation. Right. Zero. <laughs> they, they don't even separate words. Right. <laughs> because vellum was, right. I was talking about vellum earlier, about the palimpsest. Vellum's expensive. So you, you use every inch that you can use. So if you don't know how to punctuate to begin with, or you don't understand what are called in Greek particles, which are little words like the or uh, men or un, little words 
that are untranslatable. You don't translate them into English. So you actually have sounds in Greek that should not be translated into English, but nevertheless will characterize what your translation ends up saying. And if you don't get that, and you're just trying to be, this is divinely inspired and we're going to play the notes exactly as they're written, what you forget, as I said in my other book, The, uh, the Gospel of Love, sometimes you need to play da- a Bach on a didgeridoo. Mm-hmm. It sounds different than playing it on a harpsichord. Right. You've got to bring it, you know, that's what metaphor means, right? Literally, it means to carry something across and over. You've got to be able to build that, whether it's an idiom or whatever it is. And so I wrote, I wrote on my, uh, on my uh, what's it called? My blog a long time ago. I don't keep up with my own blog. But I actually do a whole thing on that one verse about baptism for the dead. Because if you punctuate it ever so slightly differently and you translate it absolutely literally, it makes perfect sense. And it's not talking about baptizing dead people. It has nothing to do with that. But, you know, most Christians are scratching their heads going, oh, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. And I give at least the Latter-day Saints a little credit because they tried to, they tried to at least extract some meaning from words that are apparently meaningless, at least in the King James. And I would dare say the Revised Standard as well. Yeah. I, I just, this has been an opening for me, uh, the, of course, through the podcast, but talking to folks who are getting into language and history that are doing these comparative analyses, uh, you know, people, I guess it's the ego, right? Our, it's our ego that says like, oh, history, I know what happened in 1936. And when I talk to a historian or a linguist or a, a translator, it's like, no, I mean, you're an expert for a reason. You know, there's... You've gone through the process. And it's not just that. It's also a question of memory. Remember that in Greek, when Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, truth literally means in Greek, non-forgetfulness. Right? Ah, the alpha privative. Lethe, the river of Lethe, right? In mythology, where you, Mm -hmm. before you get your metempsychosis takes you to the next life, you forget your past life and you move on. (laughs) So it's interesting, isn't it? Because... There's a wonderful Buddhist exercise that I participated in once with a, uh, a venerable monk about going back in your mind, right? How far back can you really remember a week ago, a month ago, same day, same time, a year ago? Most people can't get by 10 days. I mean, God rest my father's soul. I can remember him when he was older, my age now. I can't remember what I had for breakfast. Right. Yeah. Lots of people can. So when you talk about history and saying, I understand what happened in the first century AD or in 1936 or in 2006, we deceive ourselves. And I think it is ego. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a good exercise to uh, strip yourself of some of that egoistic and egotistic uh, uh, affirmations that I don't think are constructive to really developing your own personhood and interacting with other people as persons. I was, a question comes to mind. This is not necessarily related and we'll pick back up on this thread in a second, but I was asked recently why Paul is immune to viper venom. Ah, (laughs) did you, do you, can you answer that? Well, I think that, look, it depends upon your perspective. If you if you want to go into the into the very strange universe, <laughs> it's a strange uh, universe, man. <laughs> I've hung around some of the strange universe as a very young man, yeah. going back a very long time in my life, of snake handling and uh, that kind of charismatic Pentecostal. I'm going to drink strychnine and I won't die, and then the guy keels over and he dies. There's that wonderful other verse about Paul in Acts, one of my absolute favorites, where the the exorcists are out there exercising demons in the name of Jesus and in the name of Paul. And it says, I can't remember the chapter. I'm not a chapter in verse. Uh, the demons beat the hell out of them. Mm-hmm. And what the demons say to them before they beat them up is Jesus. We know, and Paul, we know, 
but you, we do not know. That's a direct quote. Mm. So maybe the snake knew Paul. That's all I'm saying. Because, and this is something that, you know, and I'm not trying to get too personal. I doubt your audience is interested in my own personal spiritual development. But part of my growth as a person has been to come to a point in my life where I no longer consume animal products. I don't condemn anybody who does, by the way, either. It is not a physical choice for me. It has nothing to do with my physique, my health. And it certainly doesn't have anything to do with my taste buds because I'm a real carnivore. That's how I was raised. Hey, I was born in 1954, man. It was the age of Ike. We were all having roast beef every other night. Okay, it was America. America best. America, forget America first, America best. However, as I've gotten older and my relationships with animals have changed, I now see animals as my friends. I feel in relationship. Even when I go for my morning walk and I see a magpie, I actually nod to it. I wave. I really do. Even to insects. That might sound a little extreme to somebody. I'm not asking anybody else to do it. I'm simply saying this works for me. But then you come back to the question, would I eat my friends? Mm -hmm. Not going to eat my friends. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'd rather die. Right. So what I'm saying is maybe Paul had a friend in that snake. And I don't think that's unreasonable. I don't think it's unchristian. There are many examples of saints in both the Western tradition and the Eastern tradition. The obvious one in the West is St. Francis of Assisi, who talked to animals. And there's certainly many in the East. St. Seraphim of Seraph, to whom I have a particular devotion, who's a 19th century Russian saint who lived with a bear for 40 years. St. Yerasimus of the Jordan, who lived with a lion, and the great one, St. Mamas of Cappadocia, who literally communicated with animals regularly. So, you know, I'm not saying you can't have a hamburger tonight. All I'm saying is if you think the cow from which the hamburger came might be your friend, you might abstain. And it's something that I've done just as part of my natural, you know, journey towards the next journey. And Paul's immune now. He's a friend. He's a he's go. a friend friend of the snake. Those snakes, man, they get a bad rap in the uh, in, in the Bible. You know. They, well, come on. I mean, it's um, yeah. But our Lord is described as the serpent on the cross. He yeah. Describes himself as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. So must the Son of Man be lifted up that I may draw all people to myself. It's not always a bad thing. So how? Yeah. Do you feel like we can go into an analysis of modern Christianity? Is that a is that a place where you can venture? Well, first I would just say this. What we call modern there is no such thing as Christendom, right? That's gone. That's a that's an historical concept that's not even valid. I'm not even sure it ever was valid because that means white European kind of Habsburg Christianity, right? Christianity is a very diverse faith. I mean, I have friends in the, I would call them Trump evangelicals, okay? And I have friends in what I would call the, the remnants of, of, of a liberation theology from Latin America, right? Back in the 70s. Hmm. Yeah, that's a big spectrum. That's a wide berth right there, my friend. So... <laughs> I'm not sure that modern Christianity means anything to anyone anymore. I will say this. I think that Christ, uh, and if we can talk about Jung for a moment, I mean, Christ means a great deal, especially in the Western. Maybe not so much in the East, but especially in the Western. And um, I think if Christianity has a task today, I don't know if you noticed that, Pew study that just came out what, in the last 10 days saying that for the first time, America is now 50%, below 50% in terms of religiosity, whatever that means, really. Yeah. 
because um, so much of religiosity is culturally driven and familially driven. So we have to be careful what we mean when we say religiosity. Nevertheless, Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, he's not a fiction. He did exist, right? Um, what does he mean to people? And this is where Jung himself did a tremendous service to Christianity, which I believe is yet to be fully appreciated mm -hmm. when he wrote Aeon and especially Answer to Job. Um, I was lucky before I was turned 22 years old, I pretty much read the collected works of Jung at least once <laughs> because What's I was so inspired by his vision for the world uh, and his vision for the internal universe of a human being and his search for the meaning that quickens, to use his phrase. Um, so um, that is something that my own sense is, and I'm speaking, I like to say, look, I was a clergyman for 34 years. I was part of the problem. I get it. I understand how institutions can, can hurt the, 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 the mission and, and, and really retard, in a sense, the gospel. But at the same time, I think that every human being has that aspiration. And whatever I can do with the rest of my life to help people in that aspiration, if it's one person or it's a million people, doesn't make any difference. You know, as a clergyman, I've preached to as few as five and to as many as 5,000. For me, there was never a difference. It doesn't make any difference because you're, all you're trying to do is to be honest and true to the message. That's it. If you can be honest and true to yourself, and be honest and true to the message, people might believe you. So I, 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 I'm very convinced that there's so much more in the third millennium of Christianity for the world to benefit from Christ. Christianity? Eh, maybe. But we have to start thinking outside the box a little bit. Well, because yeah. for God's sakes, Jesus sure did. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and I want you to grow those points a little bit, but the first thing I want to reflect on is this idea of Christianity as an institution, and I wish we spoke more about issues with institutions and with systems rather than say Christianity is this or that. And I, I think a lot of times we're participating in a scapegoating that is truly unfortunate because the essence of what Christianity does, in the same way that the essence of what Islam does and what Buddhism does, is a beautiful thing. But when people get together and create hierarchical structures and systems, we tend to bunch up in interesting ways, and we tend to blame the dogma. Oh, but, yes. But with that said, and I want to plant this seed and then, and then get where you're going— the great thing that Jung said, or one of the things that Jung said in, in the answer to Job, and I'm, if I can't find it, I'll, 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 uh, I'll get out of this thread, but I want to, well, and I'm going to, I'll bail on, uh, so essentially what I was getting at is the, is that the book of Revelation articulates the conflict that, Christ, that the, the Christian narrative gets us tangled up in. And, and I, again, I forget the quote, but it's something like that, that the, mm -hmm. the idea of, of course, of course, beginning in Job with, uh, you know, this wager between God and Satan, then with the, Satan's fall from heavens and, uh, you know, hell, and at the same time that there's an incarnation of uh, Christ on, or God on the earth, and so Christ, Antichrist, you know, that conflict of duality r gets us into a bind, and, mm -hmm. and Revelation is kind of uh, revealing or answering this conflict that we're caught in, in the same way that Job does a, a fantastic job of articulating that as well. Very much what Jung was doing in answer to Job, because, I mean, basically, Jung finds his answer to Job in Revelation. Yeah. So many and, and trying to overcome the duality. And, and this is part of the problem of Christianity. There is this, we're constantly being dualistic, right? We're constantly, it's, you know, Martin Buber's famous expression, right? I and thou. 
that's not necessarily the best way to go. Right. Right. Maybe the best way to go is to see in the other, to be to to identify with the other, because if you're going to push incarnation, right, that God became man, right? Well, that's total identification with other. Mm -hmm. That's not trying to create more duality. That's trying to reconcile <laughs> and bring it back together. And that's, I, if I can share with you one little quote from Answer to Job that I just saw. He says, the life of Christ is just what it had to be if it is the life of a God and a man at the same time. Right. And I think that's very much the way Jung expresses. It's an overcoming of the duality. And you have to look at where Jung really came from. I mean, he's a man of his own time. I mean, he was the son of a pastor. He trained to be a pastor. He's a Lutheran, for goodness sakes. I mean, <laughs> all of that conflict, right? right. That, that goes along with uh, the Germanic form of Lutheranism. Mm -hmm. uh, and he overcame that within himself and extended this through his psychiatric and psychological work to others. And I mean, to me, he's the greatest intellectual giant of the 20th century, and I include Einstein. Yeah, I, I, I feel the same. I mean, because, and I'll, the only thing I regret about Jung is that he, even though he knew Eastern Christianity, he could say, he could quote Simeon the New Theologian, about God arising in his heart like a little sun, right? He never really knew Eastern Christianity. He always comes from the West, mm -hmm. always. And that's why, you know, he, uh, he saw the dogma of the assumption being propagated in the same decade that I was born as being something that creates the quaternity in the Godhead and is an image of completion and overcoming duality, et cetera. And I'm not arguing with his psychologizing of it at all. That's fine. But it's interesting, isn't it, how the dogma of the assumption of the BVM, the Blessed Virgin Mary, really has no impact in Christianity today. Mm -hmm. It's not a big deal. Orthodox theologians and Catholic theologians, we argue, the, the we nitpick. It's like the Immaculate Conception. Well, we're, you're just, or transubstantiation. You're just being too... Uh, too particular about the details really that's where we're going to end we're going to be particular about the details i mean where's the substance forget the accidents let's get back to the substance and and that is what about the transformation of a human being who's suffering how do they deal with that suffering you know one of the great things about being a priest is you can spend you can have breakfast with a billionaire and lunch with a guy in prison and i did that on more than one occasion um, it, you, 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 you get to cut, transect, you know, every stratum of society. And it gives you a very, I think, healthy perspective on the human condition because, you know, the, the billionaire, he's in the, he's in a prison of his own making. Right. He may not be in a prison of another's making, but he's in prison still and he is suffering it. It's, and, it's, and so how do you how do you how do you liberate how do you you can't liberate anybody but how can you help them understand their own liberation and that they are in fact essentially free this is what christ really did for people i love it when he always says to someone uh, when they say can you heal me lord and then he looks at them and says can you he answers the question now he always heal inevitably he heals the person but the first thing he does is he engages them in their own process. I think that's something that the church has forgotten how to do, to be honest with you. I say church, you know, big concept church. Individual I, I, churches, individual pastors, bishops, priests, deacons, ministers, every, they, there are many people doing tremendous work every day. I don't want to agree. appear critical yeah. of people's ministries, but I'm saying, are we talking about that type of liberation and transformation? Not so sure. Well, there's no doubt that the, because to, to back to the Pew study that you were talking about, what is increasing is, is spiritual but not religious. And the way folks define that is that, you know, religion has to do with the institutional aspects and the dogmatic aspects, and spirituality is more experiential, and you can have it anyway. Exactly. 
and I think anybody, and I hang out with a lot of church people, and th- of course I hear what people are talking about relative to the uh, the decrease in, uh, you know, what I consider to be the number of asses in the seats, and uh, of course those are there are numerical aspects to this that okay how many people came today and that's a metric and so pew is saying how many people you know ascribe to this or that and we're seeing these changes what i think the religiousness of human beings it in its essence that's not changing no not at all it's It's the context and so i the church is really going to have to do a hell of a job adapting and allowing i mean the question for me is will the church allow it to be changed and transformed by what's happening with the people and that sounds a little bit like job you know do you allow for your own limitations to be reflected to you by the people who are uh, you know either coming or not that's right uh, the other a question that I has: Can you differentiate Western Christianity and Eastern Christianity? What What do you mean by that? Western Christianity, I would define as anything from uh, Boethius, sixth century uh, after the fall of Rome, Augustine, West, meaning England or you know Germany. I include the Reformation in it. It's everything kind of west of the Danube at that point. Mm-hmm. Eastern Christianity being everything in the Byzantine Empire, Egypt. Africa, the Ethiopian church. I'm very familiar uh, with the Ethiopian uh, Christianity. And going further east, even to what they call the Mar Thomas churches in India, uh, the churches that really went out there. Um, There are different, what do they say? That every schism starts in the west and every heresy starts in the east. (laughs) (laughs) I've not heard that I count myself amongst the heretics because the heretics are the fun people. Yeah, yeah. I, I walk that path also. <laughs> so, you know, origin, you know, the greatest theolo- this is this is this sums up everything you need to know about historic Christianity. The greatest single theologian, okay, of Christianity is Orientis, origin. Mm-hmm. Not origin with an I, origin with an E at mm-hmm. the end. And everyone says he's a heretic. I, and there was nobody, there's no greater Christian thinker. I'm not saying it all begins and ends with him. I'm saying just for magnitude of intellect, okay? Thomas Aquinas could barely have been his scribe. <laughs> and he all probably right. would have admitted it. Yeah. Uh, shit talking the teachers, you know, this is this is good. <laughs> Why not? I mean, you got to get real here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, and from I, what I've learned now from him is this radical uh Jung taught me this but I but I sense uh, connected with um with him is is the layers of interpretation that that uh, I I in my dissertation I used some of this work to understand certain layers of consciousness and to me it's an incredible reminder to maintain the perspective that as a reminder, just to recognize that we're always operating on different levels, if, if you will, of consciousness, and and that can kind of that can keep us from being neurotic, which you know Jung defined as one-sided. You know, just seeing it from our current conscious position. So consistently playing games with yourself and, and saying, well, you know, th- this part of me wants to do this, but that part of me wants to do that, and this is how I feel. We're always in conflict, and and. I think there's an aspect of uh, of Christianity that 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 Job was certainly recognizing and that Revelation recognized is that we we do certain things to resolve the conflict. Yes, and that ties us up very much. I mean, if you want to look at the greatest act of resolution of conflict, it's the crucifixion. Say more. Well. Heaven and earth, east and west, north and south, all the points of the compass. But I want to back up for a second. Before the crucifixion, there was the transfiguration, which back in my seminary days in the 70s, everyone was like, oh, this is simply a, a pre-vision of the 
of the resurrection transposed back before the crucifixion so that when the cruci... Please, let's not... Let's just go with what's there, right? So when you're on the Mount of Trans... I've been, I've climbed Mount Tabor in my life. It's not that high, actually. It's not a big deal. I have... You can say it. <laughs> what? You can say it. Yeah, yeah I've done that. I've climbed it. You know, it's not Everest, but I climbed it. Sure. No Edmund Hillary, but, you know. So... On Transfiguration Mountain, Tabor, Christ appears with Moses and Elias, right? Now, if you just, why Moses and Elias? Why not, I don't know, Adam and Eve? Why not, you mm -hmm. know, could it be a lot of people. Well, Moses, dead. Elias, hadn't died yet, according to the scripture. So you've got the dead and the living. Okay, that's interesting. But the most interesting thing you'll never read in a translation, unless you read mine, which isn't published. <laughs> uh, when it says that Jesus was talking to Moses and Elias about his departure in Jerusalem. That's what it always says, his departure. Like it's like his flight departure. You know, I got to leave for Jerusalem, you know, in 10 minutes. But you know what the word is in Greek? It's about the most loaded word in the Bible in Greek. And nobody translates it literally. And I always say to my Protestant friends, you know, you're, you're my Southern Baptist, you're always worried about biblical literalism, but you're not literal when you need to be. Right. The word is Exodus. Hmm. Literally. Can you imagine what a first century Christian, especially a Jewish Christian, would have thought when they heard the word Exodus? You think that's got some resonance for people? I mean, it does even today. Forget about Cecil B. DeMille. It's got resonance for people. We know what the exodus of Israel was. Even if you don't know about all the, all the plagues and everything else, how reminiscent they are of Revelation. All those plagues, and yes. swarms, and this and that. Yeah. But Jesus is talking about his exodus. The cross is an exodus. It is a journey. He literally passes over from death to life. He literally takes us with him into a new reality. We are in the Passover. That's why in the Orthodox tradition, we don't use the word Easter, which is a Germanic word for spring. We use the word Pascha, which is literally in Greek, Passover, Pesach, in Hebrew. So we, it's a Passover. We pass over from life, from life to death to life again. And, and you know, this is, this is the big moment, right? The resurrection and nobody celebrates resurrection like Orthodox Christians, okay? We break out everything for the <laughs> resurrection service. It's the biggest thing we do. However, the resurrection service and the whole concept of resurrection is inevitable. It's inexorable. You will not leave your son in corruption, it says in the Psalms. It's, it's, it's inexorable that Christ rises from the dead. We proclaim it. We sing Christos Anesti. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christos was Christ. A thousand different languages. But it's inexorable. It's the cross that is, it's the convergence of all universes into one. The multiverse collapses into itself on that cross. And there is utter transformation of, of human suffering, of death, of disease. My favorite version of the crucifixion is, of course, the Grunwald, which was painted for a hospital of syphilitics in Germany. That very gruesome crucifixion. But to me, it speaks very deeply because he's trying to communicate as an artist to the people who would actually worship in front of him, mm -hmm. whose bodies themselves were full of sores and disease, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So to me, the crucifixion is everything. And that's why in the book of Revelation, any crucifixion going on? Not really. Mm -hmm. But the lamb is there, and the lamb has been slain, and the lamb bears marks. So he is there. And it's, it's I, I, you know, I, I've always, I mean, I, I write in the, in the introduction, which was written by my friend, Father Philemon Sebastiades, to my translation of Apocalypse. He talks about how the book of Revelation, you know, it wasn't even accepted for about nine centuries. It took a while for Revelation. And since I met Martin Luther, he rejected the book of Revelation, right? Um, the book of Revelation took a long time to find its way into the New Testament canon, 
really did. Why? Because it's wild. It's so, yeah, it's wild. It's crazy. It really is. It's psychedelic. It's, mm -hmm. it's like you took some psilocybin and well, mm -hmm. what happened? Mm -hmm. uh, but that's okay because what it's doing. And I think, you know, I think answer to Job should be read in every seminary, at least in every year that you attend a seminary. And I don't care what seminary it is. Every Christian seminary should teach answer to Job because it's a way, even if you don't accept Jungianism, even if you don't accept what Jung said, or, it's a way to process the book of Revelation in a way and a great, a, a harder theology, if you will, in a way that I think is very soul cleansing. It, it makes you think. And unfortunately, I don't know where it ever became unpopular to think in Christianity. Yeah. Yeah, it distresses me. I don't understand how... I, I've recently learned that there were some copywriters who were going to step in for our business. My wife and I have a, an integrative healing business that we have a rabbi who teaches mindfulness and meditation. Mm -hmm. We've got several Eastern practitioners <laughs> who do acupuncture and herbs, and sure. we've got uh, uh, several psychotherapists and analysts or training analysts, Jungian, CBT, all, you know, family, all these various approaches. And the, the copywriters that have been sought out have rejected the practice because it doesn't fit in with their beliefs, their Christian beliefs. And I don't... I, so when it comes to Jungian, Jungianism, or, or however we want to say that, to me it's totally compatible. Jung did, a, I think, a solid job of saying, look, I'm not making theological claims here. I'm, I'm, I'm making claims of what's happening in the individual. Very correct. He said it's never about, I'm not making a metaphysical affirmation here. You're right. He absolutely left that off the table, and properly so. I think. And, and it wasn't just in, in words. I mean, he, his, the theory did it. it. It held to that. And he also said that I'm operating in this tradition. And if you were raised in a kind of westernized Christian tradition and you're trying to go into other arenas, you really need to mind this one because it's in our economic system, it's in our political system, it's in our interpersonal, our familial, our cultural we are dipped in the Judeo-Christian salsa, and <laughs> it's just the way it works. But, well, and I, I, I certainly like it, you know, but what's been exciting for me is finding this, the mysteries tradition. Mm. Uh, what, what I've, certainly through Brian and, and, and Tony uh, and, and all the folks I've been interviewing recently, we've been landing in a lot of the, the Greek and uh, kind of... Uh, Indo-Asia Minor traditions of, of religion, certainly at the time from about 400, you know, before Common Era to about 500 after. And it's totally rich with crazy mystical shit that is, yes. like, to use your word, absolutely psychedelic. And absolutely. Whether, whether or not they're using a, a substance, which... Of course, Brian's work is bringing to the foreground that that was, is common... But it's not exclusive. I, 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 I was no, recently no, contacted no. by. A nor priest. does Brian. Nor does Brian Morescu say that it is. I, I know, and that's been my struggle because I, I, I got an email from a priest recently who was really, uh, somewhat critical, but, but, but curious. Like he, it was a really good, solid email, and I, I, quite frankly, I really respected the way that this guy wrote it. But he was saying that Brian is suggesting that uh, religion was born out of a psychedelic event, and I, I didn't hear that, but. I was one of the early readers of the book before it was published. It was not. <laughs> he doesn't say that. I can assure you. Yeah, and that, and I'm about to teach a class on his book, so I'm going to deepen my knowledge. But I'll, it, yeah, I mean that this whole psychedelic, whether it is from taking a, a substance that is psychedelic or having a an experience that we would consider to be psychedelic, there's a lot of religion in that. Well, let's go back to what the word means. Psychedelic simply means revelatory of the soul. Mm -hmm. That's all it means. To, to thee, to show forth the psyche, the soul. Psychedelic. Two nice words. Um, what's wrong with that? I mean, I, I, I don't... <clears throat> you should be showing your soul. Right? Shouldn't all just be external facade. There should... You know, when someone encounters you, I don't care whether it's in a 
personal relationship, a business relationship, a professional relationship, when they show you who you are, who they are, mm -hmm. they're manifesting their yeah. soul. That's, psych that's what psychedelic actually means. They manifest your soul. I'm a translator. I, can, I have to get into it. Um, and, and that's where the book of Revelation is so interesting because the book of Revelation is manifesting something, right? It's manifesting something. What is it? Is it death and destruction for all those who don't get raptured? Is that what it's manifesting? You know, I like to I like to uh, point out that when everybody gets tossed in, everybody who's a bad person, right, gets tossed into the uh, lake of fire and brimstone, that's before God, right? I love that phrase. I love the lake of fire and brimstone. And I'll tell you why. You know the story of Lazarus and the rich man? Mm -hmm. It was often called dives in the scripture. It's in the Gospel of Luke. And it says that, you know, we all know the story, right? Lazarus is dying and the dogs lick his wounds and then finally dies. He goes to the bosom of Abraham. The rich guy dies. And it's, I love it in Greek, Keatafi, and he was buried. That's all it really says about him. He, and he says he wakes up in, and what he describes it as is very interesting. He says, I am burning in this flame. He doesn't say I'm burning in fire. In this flame, and tafti, it's singular. And I don't know if you've ever read much of Juan de la Cruz. Mm -mm. One of his most famous poems is "The Living Flame of Love," mm -hmm. and that's what God is. He even says it in Hebrews: "Our God is a consuming fire." So to be, to be in the river of fire described in Daniel, to be in the lake of fire and brimstone described in Revelation, that's to be in the presence of you're in God. Yes. You're burning in God. And the proof, if you want proof, people sometimes say to me, I remember one time, this guy walked out of one of my sermons. He was so upset with what I was saying. You're a heretic, of course. Yeah, but I had to go back to him later and say, brother, yeah. here's the proof. You didn't stay for the proof. The rich man who was walked by Lazarus every day never felt an ounce of compassion for this man in all of his suffering. He says, but Father Abraham, I have five brothers. I don't want them to come here and suffer as I do. He finally finds a little sliver of compassion in that flame. And if you tell me that flame is the flame of the devil, how did he find compassion? How did he find altruism? How did he find love that could manifest? Sorry, that's God. These are aspects, you see, mm -hmm. And this is what scripture does, it, it, is it paints these pictures in very dualistic ways. I admit it. And I'm, I don't, I'm not a big fan of dualism, but I live in the real world too. And I watch television and I, you know, I know where the forks and the knives are. So I need all that duality to get that stuff. It's very practical to be dualistic in the <laughs> modern world. But nevertheless, God's not like that. And God is all and in all. And so if you... It, Revelation has a way of bringing us to that, you know, in a striking and in a violent, I will say it, it's a violent method. But sometimes, you know, you got to get slapped upside the head, as they say, to wake up a little bit. It shakes us out of our lethargy, I think. And this is why in the Orthodox Christian Church, and I can say this because I was a priest for 34 years, the liturgy of the church is based upon Revelation 4. You read the People say to me, well, what, how does this Greek Orthodox liturgy work? I say, go to your Bible, read Revelation 4, and you'll get it. Because it is. So I want to read one little piece from my friend, Father Philemon. He says, the divine liturgy of the Orthodox Church is to this day a temporal simulacrum in this world of the eternal reality of the next world. And that eternal reality of the next world starts in Revelation 4 when it says, and behold, a door opened in heaven. Mm. I mean, a door opened. I'm looking at something, you know. And it, to me, it's fascinating because you have all these theriomorphs, right, in the book of Revelation, right? You have a bull covered with eyes. And mm -hmm. We tried to do that in the graphic novel. But the most interesting theriomorph is our Lord himself. As a matter of fact, the book got a lot of yeah. criticism on Amazon. And no, it was interesting, saying it's a blasphemy to portray Christ like this. And I thought to myself, scratch my head, I went, what do you mean it's a blasphemy? 
That's how exactly how he's described. <laughs> how is that? I mean, are you saying that I'm a blasphemer because I drew it or that the gospel writer is a blasphemer? And Young points this out in, in an interesting way. I'm not sure he ultimately resolves it, but isn't it interesting that it's the apostle of love, right? The <laughs> John the evangelist, right? Who wrote those magnificent three epistles, which are full of love, 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 love. And now we have this violent image of destruction and this and that and the other. It's to wake us up. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. To wake us up and try and instill in us a hope for the future and compassion for others. And I think that compassion is really spelled out plainly when it says at the very end of Revelation, I think in 22, chapter 22, how... You know, he describes the walls of Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem that descended and there's jewels. And this is where you get the pearly gate stuff in. Right. And all that, because the gates are a pearl, translucent, all this. But then it says that all the evil people are outside. And if you left it there, that's very dualistic. But that's not where it ends. All the 12 gates named for each of the apostles are open. No guards. Walk on in. Come on in, brother. Or as they say, what do they say in the good Pentecostal churches? Come up higher, brother or sister. Nothing's blocking you from entering into the fullness. If you want to hang outside, eh, that's your choice. But it's there. It's open. It's not shut. You know, I, I think psychologically at this point, because I, I do imagine what that uh, what is Jung or Jim Hollis, I forget who says it, but it's uh, the three A's, human beings struggle with ambiguity, anxiety, and uh, I forget the last one. Ambition. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. But the, it's the ambiguity that um, the uncertainty and the unknown and the tension of opposites that, that is, of course, interwoven through all of the Jungian literature. So what I think... The bind, and help me, I, I, I say this because I want you to uh, challenge me or wrestle with me on this. The bind that I think Jung is certainly trying to address in Answer to Job is that the, the Christian formation, when, when God incarnates in human form, we're immediately, back to what I said earlier, put into a conflict. And oftentimes the way we resolve the conflict is with... Um, to renounce or, or not even struggle with our anxiety in favor of certainty, to eradicate doubt. How am I doing so far? And I want you to put on your priest hat for a second and, uh, and explain. I don't have to put on a priest hat. I mean, I've felt this way my whole life. I mean, yeah. you're absolutely right. We don't want to have doubt. Yeah. That is such a big issue for people. I want to be sure. I want to be certain. Even my own personal quest in Christianity uh, that led me to the Orthodox Church was I felt more comfortable. I felt more certain that these guys, the Orthodox, they got it right. That's the church. Where's the church? Where are the limits? And then, you know, as you get older, you say to yourself, well, why do you need all these limits to begin with? Isn't God infinite? So if God is infinite, I mean, just on a practical basis, right, on mathematical, infinity doesn't have a boundary. By mm. definition, right? Just keeps going and going and going. So therefore, God is in everything, right? It may not be pantheism, but it's certainly panentheism. So, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, why do we have to limit it? Why do I have to be certain? And I'll tell you something. The worst thing you can ever say to any person, if you're a Christian, in my opinion, is, are you saved? Do you know you're saved? That's the worst, that's the worst opener I, I think you could ever give. Because what you're doing is you're immediately trying to place them in doubt. Yeah. So they become dependent upon you, the authority figure, and whether your authority figure is your Bible that you wave at them or this or that. And then it's all about you at that point now. Where's Christ? I mean, Jung talks about it. Isn't the Holy Spirit supposed to continue incarnating, incarnating Christ throughout history? Absolutely. That's why the church is called the body of Christ. It's not the body of Paul or the body of 
James, the body of Christ. So, but if you're making people dependent upon you and your authority, right? Where does that end up? I'll tell you where it ends up. It ends up with uh, send me $30 a month to my 800 number. Mm -hmm. It ends up with sexual abuse. And there's been tons of that in the church through the years. It ends up with cult-like devotion to personalities. And I'll tell you what it doesn't end up with. It doesn't end up with healthy Christians. It doesn't end up with people who love one another. And let me tell you something. That's the only definition, if you remember, the only definition of discipleship of Christ. This is how the world will know you are my disciples, if you love one another. That's the only definition. So if you don't love one another, if there isn't any love, and then that love has got to be for the other, not just one another, right, but for the other, the other who is different from you, whether it's a gay person or a transgender person or someone whose lifestyle you don't approve of, for whatever reasons, your cultural context, it doesn't make any difference. If you don't love them, your Christianity to me is useless. Your dogma is useless. Your religiosity is useless. You, you know, this is... Go back and read the Old Testament prophets. They talked about this all the time. Your new moons are, your festivals are a blasphemy to me. They're anathema to me. That's what the Lord said to the, to the minor prophets, right and left. Why? Because you have no love. I'll never forget one of the more saintly bishops of our church. He was a wonderful man. Uh, bishop Yerasimus, many years ago, he's passed away. He was at our seminary as a retired bishop. He actually ordained me, both deacon and priest. I feel very blessed. That I was ordained by someone whose hands I think were pretty clean. Um, and he, we, we, he, was at, he was at chapel one night. We were all in our you know, black robes. and It was a nighttime vesper service. He came out. And he looked at us all. And he, this is an exact quote he goes. You seem to me to be nothing but burnt wood. You have no love. And he walked out of the chapel. Three years of seminary is the best lesson I ever got. Burnt wood. What'd you get from that? Well, I mean, he's right. I mean, we're all there trying to be more orthodox than the next guy. We're trying to be more precise in our movements. And, you know, I swing an incensor better than you. And I know I've read John of Damascus, the exact exposition of the orthodox faith. You haven't. And I can quote Gregory Nazianzen's poems and you can't. Who cares? None of it means anything. You know, there's a reason why the Lord Buddha, Socrates, and Jesus Christ never wrote anything. Isn't it fascinating? Yes. <laughs> Actually, the, Lord yeah. Buddha, the Lord Buddha only drew a wheel. Some people say eight spokes. Some people say 12. But he drew a wheel. Socrates never wrote anything. Plato took it all down, supposedly. And Jesus, whatever he wrote in the sand with a woman caught in adultery, doesn't remain in history. And what's more interesting is it doesn't appear that any of them ever asked anybody to write anything about them. Fascinating to me. And yet, Fascinating. you put the three of them together, and you're talking about the intellectual heavyweights of the world, basically. I mean, I'm not saying they're a lot, you know. Confucius counts and other people count. I'm not yeah. di not disarming anybody else, but that's a pretty big that's a pretty big trifecta right there. Sure is. And wrote a word, and yet we sit Christians sit around and argue about words. How does that work? How are you a disciple if you love the other person? Well, maybe you just let them. You know, there's a great story from, I, I read the Desert Fathers a lot. I'm very mm -hmm. fond of them. They're great. And there's a great story of a, a particular abbot of a small monastery in Egypt. He's dying. And in the Orthodox tradition, as I believe it's also true in the West, they stay around the, the man who's dying. I mean, you get the brotherhood because this is the moment of transition. This is the crossing over. This is the Passover. So you might get some interesting information. So they all gathered around this poor monk. And they're going, Father, Father, what can we bring you? What can you tell us? And he goes, bring me so-and-so. And this was like the renegade monk in the monastery, the worst monk. He was a thief. He was, a, he was horrible. 
was a horrible monk. He should have been tossed out years ago. And they said, you want to see him? He goes, yes, bring him to me. I'm dying here. Okay. So they bring him to him. He says, come close, bro. He takes his hands and he kisses them. Kisses his hands. And the, all the whole monastic brotherhood is just shocked. They're like, what the hell is this? And he looks at them all and he goes, oh, you don't understand. He goes, these hands are the hands that open the doors of paradise for me. There it is. A lifetime spent in patience, love, long suffering, transformation. Of course, the coda to the story is that the monk on hearing this was completely shaken to the core. And before he died, they said he actually worked miracles with his own hands. His life was utterly transformed by the love and the non judgmentalness of another. That's Christianity, my friend. The rest of it. It's like what they, what, I, I don't remember who said it about Plato. He says, everything to Plato, everything after Plato is a footnote to philosophy. I can't remember who said that, but mm -hmm. everything in Christianity is a footnote to that. And, and if you don't believe that, then you're just interested in power, authority, ego, duality, oppositionalism. There's not going to be a coincidence of opposites within you. You're not going to feel it come together. And death is going to be tough. You know, I don't know if you've ever read the Tibetan book of the, of the in-between. They mm -hmm. call it erroneously the book of the dead. You know, there's some challenges coming up. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe me, go to sleep tonight. See if you can control your dreams. Most people can't. You know, you may not have nightmares as an adult. Some people still do, unfortunately. But you really don't control your dreams. But you think when you die... Your bowels evacuate, and you pee yourself, and you're dead. I've been with 50 people when they die, when they die, as they exhale, last breath, as a priest. It's a great privilege and a, a tremendous responsibility. Some as young as four months old, some as young as 90, as old, well, young as 92. Let me tell you something. That experience, you're there, you're there, you're there, you're not. But they're, they've gone someplace. And we're all going. It's inexorable. So. Well, that brings up a good point that it goes back to the story of the Buddha in, in the original myth with sickness and old age and death yes. and poverty. I, 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 certainly in the West today, I know that that's kind of one of the you know, fundamental uh, motivations of living is to get all that out of the way, to remove it. And so we don't participate in death. I talked to one person on the podcast that said that the, the, the funeral lobby in the United States is one of the top lobbies. And You have no idea unless you've dealt with funeral directors. I've done over 500 funerals oh. in 34 years. I know. And guess what? I never let a parishioner go to a funeral home alone. Mm-hmm. Always went with them. What a fucked up fact. Oh, man. It's not, it's not, it's politics. I mean, I'm sure they have their own lobbyists on K Street in DC. Yep. It's all about money, control, power, all of these things. But guess what? Somebody's lost their 15 year old little girl. And she's lying on a metal slab in, a, in the bottom of a, of, of a hospital. Well, the rest of it's bullshit. Yep. You got to deal with it. And you have to do it with it with some compassion and some other directedness, if I can put it like that. Well, and I, I was about to mention this earlier, but one of a, a meaningful um, essay that Jung wrote was, I think it's titled "Clergy or Psychotherapy" or something like that. Yes, and I've read it a long he's, time. He's looking at the the way that psychotherapy. Uh, more and more, I'm being asked to to do memorial services, and um, this this weekend, I I I was I don't know what I want to say here, but I was honored to be invited into a um, a, a synagogue to create a container for people to talk about the death of a 12 year old, and 
and it feels very priestly, you know, and, and I'm pretty conscious of that, 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 that role. So in my daily living, I encounter trauma and uh, n- neuroses and death, and it, to me, it's, this is going to sound, it's life-giving in that there is an element of, I am participating in uh, fundamental forces of existence in a powerful and reverent way. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's got nothing to do with dogma. It's just got everything to do with humanity and, and connection. Absolutely. And, and that's, that's why I think the, the, the role of the priest is such a holy space, because you are interacting and participating in these, these overwhelming, overpowering and, overpowering and fundamental forces of existence. But, so you again, have to, but you have to participate. As you were saying, <clears throat> you're there to hold the space for people. You're there not to simply depend upon the ritualization, whatever the ritualization is. I mean, everybody's got their rituals, right? Right. It's not just performance of rituals. It's creating an emotional, contextual space and giving space to grief and yes. giving space to sorrow and anguish and then also giving space to hope and remembrance. Yes. All of those things. And, and, and that's a... I don't think it can be taught. You can teach somebody how to perform a ritual. You can't teach them how to do the other. I think that you either, you may, there may be some skills that you can convey, but you either have an open heart for other people or you don't. I mean, and, and unfortunately, if you don't have an open heart and you are charged with the ritualizations, it can actually create a harder heart, right? Oof. And, and that's, that's very sad. I think for the practitioner of whatever religious faith or psychological tradition it is. And it's very sad for the parishioners who have to put up with it. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's, you know, what do you do? How do you respond? Um, you know, and, and it's different every time. That's why I've never, well, I've never written a sermon in my life and I've never written a eulogy. I'll speak the truth that's there. Whatever's there. I'll just respond to what, whatever is there. I'm not going to preset you know, I've got to click this off and this off and this off and this off. The only thing I used to do, and I'll inject a little humor, I was in a very large cathedral when I was a young priest. Sometimes we did four funerals a day. That's a lot of funerals. That'll wear you out. That'll wear you out. So I used to make sure when I arrived at the church, it's going to sound slightly gallows humor, look in the casket, make sure you know who it is, because if there's one place you can't mess up somebody's name, and you've seen it, when the preacher has forgotten a person's name, they'll say, our dear sister in the Lord. And they'll keep saying sister. Well, sister who, Jack? Do you even know who you're talking about? And it's because they don't. Right. And saying someone's name at a funeral or in that whatever memorial that is, is exceedingly important. Because you see... When someone dies, they can't answer their name, but their community, their family can. And they answer it maybe silently, but they answer it in their own mind because the invocation of a name creates the presence of the person. The image. This is very true in the Jesus. That's why the, it's the whole premise of the Jesus prayer in the Eastern tradition. The invocation of the name of Jesus brings the presence of Jesus. It's a very simple form of spirituality, but it's endured for 2,000 years and it works. If it's done with sincerity and openness and heart, I'm not saying as a ritualization only. It's not magic, right? There's even a, I think it's a Slavic heresy about the name. You know, the name works on its own, right? We mm-hmm. used to have these arguments in seminary. If you got a bunch of non believers all dressed up and they performed the liturgy perfectly, They did all the prayers. They were all the goodies, all this stuff. Is it a worship service? Is it an Orthodox? And remember, I remember the class was split half and half. Someone said, yes. It always is. (laughs) Really? I was like, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. But I was a convert amongst, I was the only convert in my class. So they were like, oh, you're just a Protestant Mary. Split half and half, man. That's the way it goes. Duality. Hey, well, it's nice to know the world works. Yeah. Instantly. 
Well, so I want to be both conscientious of time, but also I want to do our job of contextualizing any aspects of the book of Revelation that we've left out, because it's been kind of nice that you and I have been able to riff. You know, it's like a, a jazz band. We kind of picked our key, and now we've been all over the place. What are we leaving out of Revelation? And I imagine the question is, what, uh, yeah, what, what did you experience about the book of Revelation from the process of translating it? I, I, would, I would, you know, if anybody really wants to explore the book of Revelation, I think the first thing that you need to do, you don't need to learn Greek. You can read any translation you like. I would, I would stay away from like Phillips and, and the, I would stay away from paraphrases. I would go for it. There is a difference between a paraphrase and a translation. Well, King James is fine if you're comfortable with it. RSV is boring, but it's not inaccurate. Mm -hmm. um, but here's what I would recommend. Read it aloud. I did Listen that. Listen to it. Read it. Yeah. Because that's a very different experience. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, totally. Than reading it with, as we say in Greek, metomati, just with your eye. And as a matter of fact, when you're a priest in the Orthodox Church, when you pray, you are not allowed to pray without saying the words. All words are mantric. All so, words create. And so you have to say them even if you're saying them very quietly, you must hear yourself say the prayers. And, this, and I believe it's the same thing with Scripture. When I read Scripture for a devotional, in any devotional sense, I always read it aloud. Well, it felt, it. To, yeah, to me, because I did on my Easter day <laughs> when I was you know, reading and listening to the hymns, it felt like the text needed to be read aloud. So I just started doing it because it... The, the term I was saying, I said to my wife, I was like, this is the most pregnant text I've read in a long time. I mean, this is deep. It's, it, it's Yeah, it's, it is. I mean, Job does the same thing. Alchemical texts do the same thing for me. It's Those, I read alchemy. I'm just, it's so pregnant. But Revelation was blowing my mind, and it felt like it had to be expressed. And, and that, to me, is something that's, uh, you, you make it, alive, and I've read enough of this to know that when there were oral traditions that turned into written traditions that went from reading aloud to then reading silently, something's lost in translation. Oh, absolutely. That's cool you, you said You lose a that. great deal. You, you know, Christ said it, you know, I know my sheep and, I, and, and they hear my voice and I call them by name. Well, when was the last time you were called? I mean, you got to hear it. And there is something about that experience. It's one of the great things about Orthodox worship, right? We hear, chant, we sing, you know, we, we see icons, we taste the Eucharist, we touch, we make physical prostrations. I mean, there's all the senses are used. It's very helpful, actually, in yeah. terms of worship, because you, uh, you use all of these senses. I remember when uh, two years ago, when I was privileged to go to India, and I went to Bodh Gaya. Actually, I went for a teaching of his... Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, in Bodh Gaya. And then I stayed, and my wife and I stayed in Bodh Gaya for a few days. What a trip. And I've spent a lot of time at the main temple there, which is, of course, the site of, of the Enlightenment, mm -hmm. you know, all the traditions. But I was so moved by the uh, worshipers. I'm not a Buddhist. I'm a Christian. However, I have a great appreciation for interfaith experience. And um, to see them prostrating I mean, literally, for hours at a time, over and then over and over and over and over. The incense, the, the, the chanting, it was really, as an Orthodox Christian, I felt very much at home. It's like, oh, these are my cousins over here doing all this stuff because we do the same thing on our side of the, of the, uh, of the Atlantic, right? Um, it was really very moving because you sense the involvement of the whole person, not just intellectualizing. Because intellectualizing at the end is ritualizing. And it's really what, you know, if you think Christ was tough on the Pharisees, it wasn't so much he was tough. He was giving them Dharma talks. He was trying to open their minds. I mean, why did Christ always choose to do those healings on the Sabbath? I mean, even one of the heads of the Pharisees said to everybody, you know, six days you should come and get your healings, but not on the Sabbath. I mean, Christ, he didn't have the guts to say it to Christ, right? Because he had just done a miracle. 
But, you know, he did it in order to challenge their thinking. You know, here, break free from what you're doing. Break free. You know, you, you think you're observing and you're pleasing. I mean, I'll never forget, I gave a sermon once. It was a little unpopular when I was dean of our New York Cathedral. And I was standing in front of the icon of Christ. And I just looked at everybody and I said, and I pointed to the icon. I said, can I just assure you all of something today? There's absolutely nothing that you can give him that he needs. Sorry. You think you did him a favor by coming here today? You think by writing a check for 300 bucks and dropping it in the plate, you did him a favor? I'm sorry. I need to disabuse you of your own notion of how you are fulfilling your religious obligations. It ain't working. You gotta start somewhere else. And, and it's the truth. That's what Christ was doing to Pharisees. You gotta start somewhere else, bro. You, you, got, <laughs> you got so ingrained in this stuff, right? Okay, break free. What's more important, to loose your ass or your ox and take it to water? Or for this daughter of Abraham who's been bound this 18 years, for her to be loosed on the Sabbath day? Which is more important, right? Is it more important for me as a, as a Southern Baptist minister? I won't pick on them, but here we are. You're in the South. I'm in the Southwest. Um, you know, to, we don't want gays, you know, we, we, we reject homosexuality, or we reject transgender, or we reject HR1, or, or whatever. Or is it more important for you to love the other person? Which is more important? Are you pleasing God more by holding the line against the onslaught of evil? Hey, Jack, read the book of Revelation. You ain't going to hold back any evil in this world. It will come over us. It has for centuries. It, it comes in cycles. Yep. And it will come again. And you're not going to escape it with your little funny rapture fantasies <laughs> either, by the way. And leave everybody else to burn in hell. Who was it said? Well, who was that horrible? He's a brilliant saint, I guess, intellectually. But he wasn't much of a very nice guy. I think St. Bonaventure once said that for, the, for, the, for those in paradise, looking upon the sufferings of the damned, only makes sweeter their experience of paradise. Really? Your suffering makes me feel better? Mm -hmm. How did that work for Jesus? I, I as, a, as a analytical psychologist, you know, my, my kind of Jungian worldview, I, I get frustrated by how unconscious the that this dynamic is and it's just a sad circumstance that that the ideology of of love is played out in a way that is so evil you know evil i don't mean evil in in in, in I, that's why i grabbed all this stuff i wanted to you said evil and so i was like great let's go down that one road but evil is a um, evil in the form of it disconnects us from each other you know, there's a when we objectify other people, there's a certain evilness in that because we are renouncing the reality of our interconnectedness, and and I so I almost wish like, have you seen a, an apparition or a phantasm that's floating and about to devour you? I don't know. I have I know some people who have. You know, is it evil? Is genocide evil? Is the Holocaust evil? Yes, yes, yes. Well, what about on a daily basis? How does it show up in our daily living? Because we want to hang our hat on these big events that are no doubt horrible and and overwhelming and shocking, and they're also human, mm -hmm. and they also are cultivated over a long period of time. And then you have people who were once walking the, the path of somebody who was righteous and, quote, good, who's now doing these horrendous acts and mm -hmm. is justified. You know, nobody fights a battle under the banner of evil. So... To pick up on this a little bit, because my frustration is that there are a number of justified Christians out there, and let me pause that and say there are a number of people out there who justify their hatred in an ideology that they believe supports and justifies and rationalizes that hatred. Yes, and they would have happily stood by some of the members of the Sanhedrin and have shouted, crucify him, 
crucified. Yeah. We have no king but Caesar. You know, it's a, uh, it's a shame. I mean, and, and and sometimes these are the hardest people to feel compassion for, right? The guy who's 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 evidently suffering on the street, the homeless person that you walk by, your eye meets his, and then you just say to yourself, you know, I'm going to do something for this person. Give him a bottle of water. Give him five bucks without judgment. You know, that's easy to feel compassion. But the people, for me, it's been very difficult in my life for the for the self righteous. Uh, preachifying, uh, condemning, you know, trying to control everybody for those people to feel compassion for them, yeah. to, feel, to feel compassion for their ignorance and to feel compassion for their own blindness. And sometimes you have to go back and, and, and read how tough Jesus could be on the Pharisees, but he was only being tough for their own good. He was just trying to wake them up. He was giving them a book of Revelation experience right then and there trying to shake them out of their tree of self-satisfaction and self-contentment and self-justification. No, it's got to fall. The fruit's got to fall. I mean, if you either have fruit that's either the, your tree produces no fruit in which it's useless or the fruit is rotten and it's useless. You've got to be able to be picked. And you know what? The fruit is picked to be eaten by others. You know, there's a whole Eucharistic thing Ryan Murrescu and I have talked about this a great deal uh, because of the Eucharist, right? And its similarities to uh, the Dionysian feasts of Asia Minor in that late Greek antiquity. But also it's in the book of Revelation because you have this whole concept of the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? That this is when, according to Christ at the Last Supper, so to speak, he says, I will not eat or drink of this again until I drink of it anew in my with you in my father's kingdom and so there's this arc right that goes from holy thursday night and it ends really in the book of revelation at the marriage supper of the lamb where you know it's fascinating let me just if i can just pull this one expression out that i really love um it says in the beginning of 22 then the angel showed me a shimmering crystal clear river of living water it wells up from the throne of God and then of the Lamb and cascades down the middle of the city's boulevard or grand concourse. The tree of life, the tree of life, the tree that was forbidden, right? The tree of life that was forbidden overhangs either side of the river. It's on both sides, right? So the tree, there's duality, but there's also union. There's unity, yielding its fruit, bringing forth 12 different fruits, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. This is what trees are for. They're not places to hide. They're places that we should be offering to one another. And I'm going to tell you something. I've witnessed a lot in my life as a religious representative, we wouldn't call it, um, as a clergyman. If you want to win someone, if you want to bring them into God's reality, just love them. There is nothing else you can do. And eventually, and you may not see it. You may not see any of the fruit that you've offered. It doesn't make any difference. I spent a year when I did my degree in psychology, I spent a year in a, in, in a prison, a thousand clinical hours in a state prison. It's a pretty grim place. Yeah. I had 40 clients, all of them African-American except for one. And... If you ask me after that year, did you do any good? No idea. <laughs> I'm absolutely clueless as to the results of my work with these 40 men. However, I will say this. I did it. I didn't just do it because it was a part of my, you know, clinical training hours to get my master's degree in psychology. I did it as an act of love and to be there with them and to offer what I could because I had access. And most people don't have access to that level, to that one of the concentric circles of hell, the American prison system. And I did. So whatever it was, it doesn't matter that I saw anything, right? You don't need to see everything. Even Christ said that to Thomas. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. 
So do we have to control everything? Do we have to dualistically and objectively grip everything and make it fit our vision of the universe? If you're doing that and you say you're a Christian, brother, go look in a mirror. <laughs> you got a long stare Amen. ahead. Amen. Amen. You got a long stare ahead. Just Wait. You said something that I want to clear up. First of all, thank you for that, what you just said. There are sometimes when I, when I do these, uh, these recordings, I, I go into a different state. You know, we're, I, you know, I'm interacting with, I'm taking notes, I'm connecting with you, and we're building relationship. Mm. And I, I have this little uh, secret that I have these moments where I think I can't wait to listen back to this <laughs> and, and to be, to be a little more of an observer of the experience than in it. And I can't wait to listen back to some of this, because I think this is the kind of theology that makes the most sense to me. And when we, and that's why I like the Jungian landscape is to me, it offers an entry point into Christianity that, makes a ton of sense in both this world and the other world. Very and much. With that said, I interviewed a guy recently who was critiquing Brian's book. <coughs> and you translate and you, you can read Greek. And you just mentioned it. He said there's not a single spot in ancient text that... I think he said there's no moment where Dionysus engages in the transformation of water to wine. And, and he was saying that, you know, he was like, there are some inaccuracies in what Brian was writing about. And in fact, one of the things he, he said is that this connection between Christ and Dionysus. And I wonder, is there a, do you see that relationship, Christ and Dionysus? Well, I'll just put it to you this way. And again, I don't care what Bible you read, you won't find this in a footnote. But if you, if you know Greek and you know classical literature, it's as obvious as the nose, my rather large nose on the end of my face, as my grandmother would say. You know the story of the conversion of St. Paul, right? Everyone knows it, right? On the road to Damascus. Yes. We even use it in, in language. Did you have a road to Damascus moment? As if you woke up to something, right? As if that's your Buddha moment in Bodh Gaya. Uh, so St. Paul, you know, Jesus has taught Paul, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then Jesus says something to him rather interesting, which most people... Don't even give it a second thought. It's hard for you to kick against the goads, G-O-A-D-S, or spur would be the alternate, like a like a spur, right? Hang on, Mark. Sorry. Oh, hello there. <laughs> Hi, sweetheart. Aren't Hang you on. One? Hi, honey. Hang on real quick. Let me. Hi, sweetheart. That's, that's the huh? best part of the interview right there, bro. It's awesome, right? Yes. <laughs> you kidding me? I have three Say granddaughters. Hi. Say hi to Mark. Say hi. Hi, sweetheart. This is Sufi. Say hi. 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 Yeah. hi. So nice hi. to meet you. Yeah. All right, camo girl, you know what? I'm going to take you back downstairs. I can't even see you. You're in camouflage. Yeah, I think she was. I can't see you. I actually saw camos, and I was a little concerned. <laughs> it's amazing. There's this uh, disembodied voice. Hang on, let me shut that door. Remember that point, though, because I want to... Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sufi, I love you, baby. See you in a second. Love you. Man, there is there are a few things better in life than a smelly child. She's been playing That's outside, right. so she's stinky. Uh, okay, sorry, I resumed that. Yeah, so everyone knows the story, right? It's Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It's hard for you to kick against the goats or spurs, however you want to translate it. Well, what most people don't realize is that the expression kick against the spurs is used by Dionysius, Dionysus, in the Bacchae of Euripides to tell the king, why do you resist the worship of me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So here's your choice. And I just give this to any Christian. Either St. Luke has appropriated from the Bacchae of Euripides, which of course was written 500 years before the birth of the Lord, and is putting that into the mouth of Christ, or St. Paul is using Euripides and putting that into the mouth of Christ. Or here's the most fun one of all. Jesus is quoting Euripides. <laughs> you pick. But it's one of the three. But and that... you won't find a Bible anywhere in the world that will footnote. And I can 
it's out just out of my reach on my bookcase next to me, the Bacchae of Euripides in Greek, and I have a note as to exactly where it occurs in that text and where it occurs in the Acts of the Apostles. So, was there a connection? Come on. Anybody who says there is no connection <laughs> doesn't know anything about the ancient world, and they've, you know, they've, it's, I'll, I'll tell a very quick story from the man who taught me how to be a translator, William Turner Avery, who used to teach at Tulane, and then he taught at the University of Maryland. He was one of the smartest people I've ever met. And he said that when he was teaching ancient Greek at Tulane, he had a, a young evangelical student who objected to the word wine in the New Testament. He goes, well, what, do you, what does it mean? It doesn't mean wine. It says wine. He goes, no, it doesn't mean wine. Well, what, what does it mean? It says it means fruit of the grape, like grape juice. Uh, and so Avery said, he told the story, wiping his brow, saying, so you're telling me that everywhere in the Greek language, the word means wine, except here. And the guy goes, yes, that's what I'm telling you. God. And his response was, young man, I simply can't do anything for you. <laughs> you got me, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. You can't, there's no comeback. Yeah. Right? So, you know, it's the same thing. Of course, there's a connection now. Is that con and that connection clearly would have resonated in first century. If you know anything about Asia Minor, the Galatians, that region, the seven churches of the apocalypse. Hello, it's the Roman postal road. Yep. If you've ever looked at it, mm -hmm. that region would have been rich with Dionysian worship and rich with Dionysian tradition. Now, and yes, the Dionysus did turn water into wine. But Jesus just didn't turn water into wine. He turned wine into blood. Mm -hmm. So there's an extra component there. And that's a conversation that Brian and I are continuing to have because I'm, I'm very much interested in, because I, as an Orthodox Christian, I do believe that the Eucharist is literally the flesh and blood of God. So I'm in that camp. Uh, but I think that there are different interpretations to this and how this is understood and what this means for personal transformation and transformation of communities that share in this is a very important thing. I'm against closed communion. I'm for mm -hmm. uh, enlightened communion, meaning people really understanding what it is. And uh, I don't know. There's a whole, this is a whole thread of conversation. We just don't have time for today. I, I can yeah, I'm staring at the clock like, oh shit, man. Like, uh, yeah. you know, we need more. We're done here. <laughs> We're done, <laughs> But, but I would say that the, your friend who said, or your associate who said, there's no connection, doesn't know much about ancient history and really doesn't know much about the gospel. Because, the, I mean, just to give you another connection, right? You know that the idea about behind ergot, right, on uh, barley, mm -hmm. and wheat, is that it's overly ripe and it becomes a mold, mm -hmm. right? Have you ever read the fourth chapter of the book of, the encounter with the Samaritan woman in the Gospel of John, where at the very end of that story, Jesus looks at the disciples and says, as the, as the Samaritans are running out of the town to meet him, and he looks at the disciples and says, Behold, the fields are white for the harvest. A lot of evangelicals know this phrase, right? It's time for us to go out there and soul win. No, white literally means is that it's rotted. It's rotting. It's turning white, which means it might have some air gut on it. So. Mm -hmm. Which means it could be a crazy party in a little bit if you if you do that. Yeah, if we bake this bread, it's going to get a yeah, little strange. It's going to get weird. So you know, there's there's lots of connections that yeah that to be honest with you, John, we just we don't have the information, and I admire Brian because Brian's looking for uh, through archaeochemistry and other things. He's looking for evidence. He's not looking for speculation. We can speculate about the Gnostics sitting around smoking dope and, <laughs> and dropping mushrooms all day long. They probably did, some of them, mm -hmm. if you know anything about Gnostic, you know. And nobody knew more about the Gnostics than C.G. Jung, okay, mm -hmm. from that point, from a psychological point of view. So, you know, but there isn't enough documentation and evidence. But I admire Brian because he's looking for evidence. And that's, I think, uh, a worthy endeavor. I encourage him.
Uh, I do too. I think his work is fantastic. It's it's really opening a lot of doors. Okay, I am conscious of the fact that talk about pregnant. This conversation is, and I, I just want to keep going, but we got to finish. Well, we can deliver this baby for now. <laughs> worry about that's right. That's right. Let more babies to come. Yeah. So, uh, what are we leaving out? What do you need? Where do you want to direct people? What would you like people to know as we close out? Well, I mean, I just encourage people to open their own minds and be and not not be so willing to accept the opinions of others, right? There's that, I, I would just end with this. There's that wonderful moment when Jesus says to his disciples, who do men say that I am? Some say you're Elias, some say you're this one, some say you're John the Baptist, risen from the dead. And then there's that wonderful moment when Christ looks at them and says, who do you say that I am? There's that encounter with Christ that I think has to be deeply personal. And I'm not an anti-church person. I'm not anti-community in any way. I'm a member of the community very committed. But take responsibility for your own set of beliefs. Don't just drink the Kool-Aid that somebody passed to you. I really think, well, my studies of Buddhism have given me one appreciation. It's one thing I love about the Dalai Lama. One of the reasons I went to see him first. Be responsible for yourself and for your beliefs. Own it. If you're going to believe it, really believe it. If you say you love other people, show me that love. If you say that love is God is love, show me God. Right? Show me some love. Not condemnation, judgment, exorcism, blah, de, blah, de, blah, de, blah. All of that belongs to the Pharisees. Show me what the disciples would have done. That's where I'd leave it. Amen, brother. I mean to that. Thank you. John, it's been a great honor and a privilege to be with you. I really want to thank you for inviting me. But I know Tony and Brian probably twisted your own. No twists. Are you kidding me? I totally initiated it. I was like, <laughs> guys, I'm going to talk to them. Well, I will say this. Yeah, I follow the muse. And when Tony and Brian were saying, this guy is uh, fantastic, I, I just thought, great. I'll, I'll follow that thread. And uh, oh, yeah. a, 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 real blessing, a blessing it has been. And I'm me grateful, well, really, truly. Well. I look forward to connecting in person one day. You too, man.